this one hour Zoom program at the East Hampton and West Hampton libraries, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which was ratified on August 26, 1920, giving women the right to vote nationwide. I'm Arlene Hinkemeyer, Vice President of the League and Chairperson of the League's 100th Anniversary Committee, which has sponsored many programs over the past few years. First, celebrating the 100th anniversary of women winning the vote in New York State in 2017, with 11 programs that we okay. sponsored or co-sponsored. Then the 100th anniversary of the formation of the New York State League in November 2019 with a wonderful program, we, a live program we had at the Bridgehampton Library. Then the 100th anniversary of the National League of Women Voters in February 2020 and now the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment this August. For the program today, we've invited the expert, speaker Antonia Petrash, who is president of the Long Island Woman's Suffrage Association and author of the book, Long Island and the Woman's Suffrage Movement. She has spoken at many libraries and historical societies throughout Long Island. She is also the retired director of the Glencoe Public Library and a member of the League of Women Voters of Port Washington, Manhasset. The title of her PowerPoint presentation, as you see on the screen, is To Win the Vote, A Lifetime of Struggle. After her talk to show how far women have come in the past century, Estelle Gelman, co-president of the Hamptons Shelter Island North Fork League will acknowledge the names of the women elected officials in the town and village of East Hampton and the villages of Southampton Town. We've had to divide up the uh, women elected officials because there are all, um, there are actually 45 women elected officials in the all in, in the East End towns. This will be followed by a question and answer session handled by East Hampton Library reference head, Stephen Spataro. I want to note that we are all wearing the Votes for Women sash um, in honor of the mighty suffragists on whose shoulders we stand. Now, Antonia Petrash. Okay, thank you, Arlene. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we, we need your photo. They're good. Okay. Okay. The host will stop. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. And we're going to have uh, to contract 72 years into about 40 minutes, but we've done it before. We can do it again. Um, I'm welcoming you all to our celebration of the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, when we talk about the women's suffrage movement, we, we sometimes say, we usually say, that it began officially with the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, uh, which, at which point Elizabeth Cady Stanton asked for the right to vote for women, which was very, very daring. But we do know that um, the right to vote was asked for uh, by women, political equality was asked for by women way before that. The fight to women, of women to have equal voice in their government began long before the Seneca Falls Conference in 1848. And we, we know that um, Abigail Adams asked John Adams when he was creating the Constitution to remember the ladies. All men would be tyrants if they could. Um, unfortunately, he laughed and thought that that was ridiculous and he did not listen, which made it difficult for women for many years to come. But The sound, um, Antonia, your sound is off. Antonia, your sound is off. I keep putting it on, but it doesn't, can you hear me now? Yes, now. Okay. <clears throat> 1848, the Seneca Falls Conference. 
um, marked the first time women had actively campaigned. But again, as we said, women had asked for equal rights long before then. Uh, the Seneca Falls Convention was just really marked a time at which women uh, came together and, and really organized for political equality. And at that point in time, um, women, especially married women, had no rights at all. If you were single, you could keep wages if you had a job. But if you were married, anything that you owned, anything that you earned, even your children were owned by your husband. And you didn't even own the clothes on your back. So uh, at the Seneca Falls Convention, they were asking for equality for women, political equality. But uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton also asked for, for the vote. And people said, oh, that's ridiculous. You'll make us look ridiculous. And she said, no. If we don't have the right to vote, it really doesn't matter what other rights we have. Um, after that, uh, Susan B. Anthony was not at the Seneca Falls Convention because she didn't know uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton at the time. She was very involved in abolition. But soon after, a couple of years after uh, uh, the Seneca Falls Convention, she did meet Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The two were introduced. Um, on a corner in, in the town of Seneca Falls. And it was a very historic meeting. And it just resulted in a friendship that lasted over half a century. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the better writer. Susan would travel and give the speeches. Elizabeth had seven children. Uh, Susan did not ever marry and never had children. So they made a perfect combination. Um, and they worked together during the Civil War, they were asked to give up their suffrage work, which Elizabeth Cady Stanton didn't want to do. Uh, Susan B. Anthony didn't want to do, Elizabeth convinced her, because they thought if they gave up the work during the Civil War, that they would be rewarded with the vote for their war efforts, and that didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen for the 14th Amendment, it didn't happen for the 15th Amendment. Um, in 1872, Susan B. Anthony was so angry that the um, passage of the amendments without giving women the right to vote, that she went into the polling place and voted herself. And she took 12 women with her and they were um, arrested and fined $100, which she never paid. So we move ahead. Uh, I always like to move ahead to 1900, not because they were not busy. They were busy. They were busy uh, with conventions, with uh, newspaper articles, with speeches, but they didn't have much success. Uh, by 1900, we can see only four states gave women full suffrage, and those states were all in the West, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho. Um, some people spe uh, speculate that the Western states wanted to entice women to move there, and that kind of makes sense, especially when you consider that the ratio of men to women was six to one. So even if they gave women the vote, there were six more men to every woman, so the chances of the women making any effective changes was very small. And so again, they gave women the right to vote in those four states, full suffrage. Again, all in the Western states. Uh, so 1900, it's not doing too well. I mean, they're in the doldrums. They only have four states with full suffrage. The, the, um, the beginning women are now are very old. Uh, Susan B. Anthony will die in 1906. Elizabeth Cady Stanton dies in 1902. So the movement really needs some new blood. So uh, Harriet Stanton Blatch, who is Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, comes back from living in England with her husband, Harry, and they settle on Long Island. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton sort of takes a back seat now. She's getting older. So Harriet Stanton Blatch decides that she will take over, and she decides that there's a couple of paths that they should take to success. One of the first paths is something that I think we should be very uh, cognizant of today as well. She thought that women should become politically educated. They should get on the train and go up to Albany. They should go down to Washington and knock on the representatives' doors. They should see how a bill becomes a law. They should know who their representatives are. All good advice for today as well. And then she thought that she should uh, impress on every woman across the spectrum of ethnicity, of income, of age, what the vote would mean to them. She worked with young women who worked in factories. Uh, she worked with older women. And then she also enlisted uh, in, in the program some friends of hers who were wealthier women uh, and who had the money and the time to invest in suffrage. 
So she started inviting some of her uh, wealthier friends to become involved, one of which was uh, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. Um, Anne Morgan was J.P. Morgan's daughter, as you can see in this picture. And they called them the Mink Brigade because they would go to celebrations, they would go to parades, and they'd have their very fancy clothes on with their mink puffs. And But they were very supportive, and they gave their time, they gave their money, uh, and they gave themselves to the cause, especially Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. <clears throat> Alva built a house in Sands Point to support the suffrage cause, and then she also built her little cottage in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, we were just up there before the pandemic hit um, in February, and it's a very, very beautiful, impressive mansion. They will be having celebrations of her uh, work there in a couple of weeks to celebrate the centennial there as well. Uh, she spent a lot of time and money, and she would also give tours of the house to raise money for the suffrage cause, which her neighbors were not too happy about. They thought, <clears throat> excuse me, they thought that she was being a little tawdry by charging money to get in her house, but she felt anything, she would do almost anything for this women's suffrage movement, and we were very grateful to her for that. Other wealthy women, Catherine Dewar Mackey, who lived in Roslyn, Rosalie Gardner-Jones, who lived in Cold Spring Harbor, uh, Rosalie was a descendant of the Gardner family and the Jones family. Uh, Gardner, I think everyone on Long Island um, knows about Gardner's Island and the Gardner family. And Jones um, owned the strip of land on the southern part of our island. Um, fortunately for us, unfortunately for him, he lost it in a tax lien to the state of New York, which made it available to us for Jones Beach. Um, Rosalie Gardner Jones was a very staunch suffragist. She believed that the, the um, movement should have discipline and military spirit. So she called herself the general. <clears throat> Why not? If you're going to call yourself something, you might as well be the general. Um, her mother was a very staunch anti-suffragist and she would constantly berate Rosalie for her work and say, what are you doing? You should be home. You should be going to cotillions. You shouldn't be worrying about suffrage. Uh, but Rosalie was a very, very active suffragist, and she decided one of the ways that they could get attention was to walk to Albany. <clears throat> and she organized the March to Albany in December of 1912. They marched 13 days, 170 miles. Now it was cold, it was winter, and only five of the original marchers got to Albany, but along the way people would join them People would, uh, school children would march with them for a while. People would join them and take on the spirit of the suffrage movement. Edna Buckman Kearns was another woman who was very active in the suffrage movement on Long Island. She came from Rockville Center and she was an editor of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which was very unusual position for a woman at that time to have. Uh, she used the um, Brooklyn Daily Eagle to publish suffrage articles in favor of the women's suffrage movement. And she had been given a wagon by the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. The wagon was named the Spirit of 76, not because it had been built in 1776, but because she felt that um, taxation without representation was just as tyrannical in 1915, 1913, as it was in, 19, in 1776. She would fill the wagon with uh, pamphlets and drive all over the island. She took her daughter with her. Um, they would go to the beaches, they would go to the parks, they would go to places where people lived and congregated, and she would talk about the need for women's suffrage. Um, the wagons on display in New York State Museum, they, they did say that it might come down to Long Island uh, this fall, <clears throat> but it's not settled yet. Um, out in East Hampton, you have uh, Mary Root Manson, um, who was a leader of the women's suffrage movement there. And you can see that this is, you probably, maybe some of you have seen this marker. Arlene Hinkemeyer was instrumental in getting this marker placed in honor of this woman in East Hampton who worked very hard there for the suffrage cause. Unfortunately, she died right before the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Uh, and another woman out from the East End was um, Mrs. Margaret Slocum Sage from Sag Harbor she was the widow of wealthy businessman, Russell Sage. Russell Sage really wasn't in favor of suffrage. Uh, so when he died was when she started beginning to donate to uh, the suffrage movement. And she was a very staunch supporter of the suffrage movement. <clears throat> so 
by 1913, um, it's becoming obvious that nothing's happening much. There's still only a few states giving women full suffrage. And so there are two young women, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, decide that they're going to form the Congressional Union. Um, it's an arm of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which is at that point in time led by Carrie Chapman Catt. And they are told that they could go down to Washington and start to form a union uh, to work specifically on getting an amendment to the Constitution. Until now, there have been two ways they've been doing it. They've been working state by state method, but that was taking so long that the young women at this point in time are going, why is this taking so long? It's been over 60 years. We've been working so hard. We're now at this point in time in 1848, women had no rights, but in 1913, many of them had been to universities. They were in, in, involved in, in professions. And they're getting very, very impatient and saying, why is it taking so long? So they formed the Congressional Union and they also thought that there was a need for publicity as Rosalie Gardner Jones had. So they planned a massive parade scheduled for the day before Wilson's inauguration. <clears throat> and when Wilson came to the station to, uh, for his inauguration, he said, where is everybody? And they said they're over at Pennsylvania Avenue in the suffrage parade which did not make him very happy because he wasn't really in favor of, of suffrage. <clears throat> uh, but this uh, parade attracted thousands of people. It was led by Inez Osevain Milholland, um, who was a very dedicated suffragist. Unfortunately, she became very ill and died along the way while she was com campaigning for suffrage. So they could sort of call her the martyr, the first martyr for suffrage but she had a white horse that she would ride around town. And she had, as you can see, she had a beautiful cape and she led the parade in uh, March of 1913. <clears throat> as you can see, there's hundreds of thousands of people there uh, because this was something really, nobody did parades. I mean, women were supposed to stay home, stay with their family, stay with their children. All of a sudden they're out walking in the streets, carrying placards, asking for rights that men have that most men don't want to give them. So it's a very controversial thing for women to do. It attracted a lot of attention. And as you can see, people started to clutter up the uh, walkway and they finally couldn't get through and finish the parade. And then they started to become abusive to them. Many of the men would um, pull them off their horses and take their banners. And there were some injuries reported. So the Parade became a, a very serious ending, but they did get a lot of a lot of attention from it, a lot of publicity. <clears throat> the role of African American women in the in the parade and in the movement was a very contentious one. Unfortunately, um, the white women were afraid that if they invited the African American women to join them, that the Southern states would rebel and not vote for the amendment. Uh, but the African-American women wanted to become involved. They were asked to march at the back of the parade on the March 13th parade. And they said, no, we're gonna march where, with our group. And they refused to march in the back of the parade. <clears throat> but they, they were, unfortunately, um, they were discriminated against. And a lot of the uh, white women felt that they had worked so hard for abolition and the black men had give, been given the vote and white women didn't get the vote. So there was a lot of, uh, hard feelings there uh, involving the African American women, and for years later, not just after the, not just until the amendment was passed. <clears throat> As you can see, panic ensued. We saw that in the picture, um, but they did get sympathetic coverage from the news media, something that they were very happy to have. Um, As we said before, they were working on two paths to the amendment, to the vote rather, a state by state path and then the amendment path. And they decided that they would continue with the state by state while they were trying to get the, the amendment passed. Um, so in New York, the New York project was started by Harry Burton Laidlaw from Sands Point, who worked with Carrie Chapman Catt. And they were convinced that if they could get New York women to win the vote, uh, the population um, in New York was the largest in the nation. So with 44 votes in the House of Representatives, if they could get New York um, 
women suffrage in New York, that that would tip the balance towards the national amendment because then New York women could vote for people who would vote for the amendment. Just as they had had to go out west to the states out west and ask the women out west who had the vote to vote for people who would vote for the amendment. So New York women travels with the state gathering um, 1 million signatures on petitions from women who wanted to vote. Um, many women, had, many people had claimed women really didn't want the vote and it was being forced on them. So they wanted to show by their petitions with a million signatures that women in New York really did want the vote. Uh, it came on the ballot in 1915 and it was defeated. Um, so it came back again in 1917 and uh, it was finally, um, let me get back, I'm sorry. It was finally won in New York State. But this is Harriet Burton Laylaw and her husband James. James was the president of the Men's League for Women Voters, a full women suffrage, and he worked very hard. And it was difficult for the men too, because they would march in the parades and people would stand on the sidelines, men would stand on the sidelines and make fun of them and throw things at them and call them names but he was very, a very staunch advocate for women's suffrage. Um, Harriet Burton Laidlaw was, again, the really pivotal point, the hard worker with Carrie Chapman Catt, and she also tried to uh, get pre President Theodore Roosevelt involved. Theodore Roosevelt was not in favor of suffrage, especially when he was president. Um, he just didn't see there was any need for it. His wife was not in favor of it as well. They were lukewarm towards it. But then in 1912, when he was running for president of the Bull Moose Party, um, I guess he figured 20 million more voters might not hurt. So he became a very staunch advocate. And even though that sounds a little cynical, he did uh, support it until the very end. Unfortunately, he died again right before it was passed. Um, this was in 1915, this parade. And what they're carrying on those placards is the signatures for the petitions that they had gotten, the 1 million signatures. Uh, two years later in 1917, they tried again and put it on the ballot again, and they were finally successful and New York women could vote. It was fortunate that they got it on the ballot in 1917 in April because the United States entered World War I right after that. And it was, it's been speculated that if they hadn't had it on the ballot, it wouldn't go on the ballot because of the war. <clears throat> So in Washington, D.C., the, the Congressional Union is still working for the amendment and not, not having much luck. So they decided, again, they would try something very daring. They would pick at the White House and embarrass President Wilson into considering the amendment. This had never been done before. Nobody had picketed the White House, especially women. Now they're leaving home, not just to parade in the streets, but to picket our president in front of the White House, carrying placards that say, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Uh, they would have placards that would take the words of his speeches and throw them back at him. He used to say that he wanted to make the world safe for democracy and they would say, you don't have democracy in your own nation. How can you claim that? Um, they would start, they started January 10th, 1917. They were very, they were silent sentinels. They would uh, stand in the front of the White House and the president would sort of paternalistically pat them on the head uh, figuratively and say, oh, they're going to get tired of it. They're just, it's cold. They're just going to have a little fun and then they'll go home. Well, they didn't go home. They didn't go home for a year. They picketed six days a week in the cold, in the summer, in the winter. Uh, they had picket days for um, teachers. They had picket days for nurses. Some people brought their children. Um, it was a very, very long and very tedious project. <clears throat> Again, they simply said nothing but carry banners proclaiming new demands. How long must women wait for liberty? And until we entered the war in April of 1917, um, they were, it was fine. They were not harassed. But then when we entered the war, they were considered to be anti, uh, they were disturbing the peace and that they were uh, against the democracy in our country. And so people started to uh, pull them down, pull their, pull their uh, banners down. They were arrested for disturbing the peace. They were physically abused and sent to jail. And they were asked to plead guilty. And they said, no, they're not pleading guilty because they weren't guilty of anything. It was their right to do that. 
Uh, they were placed in a, a very difficult prison uh, called Okuquan in outside of Washington, D.C., and they, were, they would go on hunger strikes, and nobody knew where they were. That prison was in Virginia, and many of their family members didn't know where they were. So they picketed all through the spring, as I said, in the summer, and then finally at the end of the year, after the hunger strikes and the beatings, at the end of the year, finally President Wilson uh, said, let's put an end to that. And he instructed the um, Senate and House of Representatives to consider the amendment. Again, the women had been asked to be considered political prisoners and they were not allowed to do that. If you were a political prisoner, you could wear your own clothing and you got better food and better conditions. But they said, no, nope, you can't be considered political prisoners. This is Lucy Burns in the back there. She was the most arrested suffragist. Uh, she was the one that had formed the union with Alice Paul. Finally, as, as we said, um, he was stung by the criticism. And in January of 1918, the House of Representatives passed the amendment. Uh, the Senate took till June of 1919, and the amendment was finally passed. Now it has to go on uh, ratification of 36 states. As we know, we needed to have three quarters of the states, and we had 48 states at the time. So it goes around the country, and it's ratified. Some states refused to ratify it. And New York State ratified it in June, uh, almost immediately after it was passed. Um, but it needs 36 states, and it's pretty, it's pretty hard sell, especially in the southern states. Some of the southern states never ratified it until um, in, well into the uh, 19th, uh, 20th century. So uh, by March of 1920, again, 35 states had ratified it. And from March till August, they had no states ratify it. So the 36th state was finally Tennessee, and Tennessee didn't want to have it either. Most people, when they were polled in Tennessee, were not in favor of, of the amendment at all. But they did have um, some people, again, change their votes at the very last minute. And finally, on August 18th, by one vote, it was amended to the Constitution on August 26th. It was, it had, was ratified, and then it had to be added to the Constitution formally. And that date was August 26th. So that's why we say that's the date that was a formal law. And the battle was finally won. And now we consider Women's Equality Day as August 26th. A little bit of a difference of opinion there with the 18th and the 26th, but the 26th is the actual day that it became the law. Um, again, African-American women were still struggling, uh, even when they were given the vote and said that they could register. Um, when they went to register, they were required to pay property taxes, and in some cases, asked to read and write the entire state constitution. And many of them were just disenfranchised because of all these restrictions. Uh, the Voters' Rights Act of 1965 um, made some difference, but there are still problems that arise today. <clears throat> so the Women's Suffrage Association, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, voted to change their names to the League of Women Voters. This woman all the way over on the right was the first president, Maud Wood Park, and um, Carrie Chapman Catt was uh, instrumental in starting the League of Women Voters. Um, she had anticipated the need for the new women voters for an organization that would help them use their new freedom to make the country safer for their children and their children's children. So on November 19th, 1919, even before the ratification, um, she began the um, New York State League changed their name to the League of Women Voters. And then um, in February 1920, the League of Women Voters, the National Association was formed. And so we have the League of Women Voters today that still its aims include civic reform, women's rights, and citizens' education. And women's League of Women Voters has believed in the power of women to create a more perfect democracy since 1920 when the League was founded. <clears throat> democracy is not a spectator sport. And today, the League is a unique nonpartisan organization that is a recognized force in molding political leaders, shaping political policy, and promoting informed citizen participation at all levels of government. And that's our celebration. What will be will happen in the next hundred years? Who knows? Excellent.
Thank you very much, Antonia. Um, I'm going to turn the floor back to Arlene. Okay, I can stop screen sharing. Sure, yep. Okay. Look at all those faces. Okay, well, actually, Estelle Gelman is the next person to be on. She's the co president of our league. So, Estelle? Okay. I am Estelle Gelman. I'm co president of the League of Women Voters of the Hampton, Shelter Island, and the North Fork. And I'm delighted that so many of you have been able to join us this afternoon. When we look at the political landscape today, it's hard to realize that it was just 100 years ago that the 19th Amendment giving, the woman, giving women the right to vote was passed. And here we are, just 100 years later, with women not only voting, but running for and holding elective office. And in celebration of how far we've come and in appreciation of their service to our community, we would like to recognize the women elected officials in the town of East Hampton and the villages of South Hampton. If, uh, if those of you who have joined us would just say hi, I think you're gonna get highlighted on Zoom. So let me read the names and hopefully you will be, uh, we'll see you. Uh, in East Hampton, we'll start with East Hampton. In East Hampton, we have in on the town council, we have Deputy Supervisor Sylvia Over Overby and uh, Kathy Burke Gonzalez. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kathy. Uh, then we have Town Assessors Jill Massa and Jeannie Nielsen. Hi, everybody. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi. We're not really seeing everyone, but all right, we're hearing you. Uh, we also have Town Clerk Carol Brennan and Town Justice, Lisa Rana, Rana, and East Hampton Town Trustee, Susan McGraw Heber. And then we have East Hampton Village Trustees, Barbara Borsack and Rosemary Brown. Hi. 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 And then we have in the villages of South Hampton, we have in North Haven Village, we have Deputy Mayor E. Diane Skilbrett. Hi all, and thank you for having this wonderful program. Hi. Uh, and then in the village of Quag, we have Trustee Jeanette Obzer. And in Sagaponic Village, we have Deputy Mayor Lee Foster and village trustees, Lisa Durye Thayer and Joy Seeger. Wonderful program, thank you. Thanks for joining us. In Sag Harbor, we have Mayor Kathleen Mulcahy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for including us. Hi. And then in Southampton Village, we have Trustee Kimberly Allen. And then in the village of West Hampton Beach, we have the village mayor, Maria Moore, and associate village justice, Martha Rogers. And I guess that's it. Thank you all. We really appreciate your work. Thank you. And Arlene, are you going to? Well, let's see. I guess now uh, we could have, I do have some closing statements to make later, but I wonder if um, this is the good time for the Q&A. Stephen, I think you were going to handle that. Are there any questions? Um, if anybody has any questions, if they'd like to um, type them in the chat, um, I will gladly read them um, to our guests today. Or if you would just like to unmute your mic and ask a question, that's fine too. Or um, there's a little raise hand feature in Zoom where you can select the little raise hand and then I can uh, unmute your mic and you can ask the question. So. Whatever is uh, more comfortable for you, um, the floor is open. I'd like to ask a question. Lee Foster, can you hear me? Sure. 
Um, of those women who stood out in front of the White House for that year, is there actually a historical record for their names and were any of them from this region that uh, you might know of? Yes, can you hear me? Because I lost my picture. Yes, certainly. Okay, yes, definitely. Oh, there I am. Well, I don't have to be that big. But, um, yes, definitely. There is a list of their names and, and their, the places that they came from. And there were some people from this area, Louisine Havemeyer, who was 73 years old. She picketed the White House, was arrested and sent to Okaquan uh, prison. Uh, Louisine lived out on the east end of Long Island. She was married to a man who was called the Sugar King. He was a very wealthy man who developed the sugar industry. And she, after he died, she became active in suffrage. And she was uh, a picketer and she did, was arrested and she was sent to prison. There are other women as well from this area. Uh, there are definite uh, lists of them and uh, where they came from and um, their stories. So it's all very well documented. Wonderful. Could I you mean, I can tell you where to find it if you're interested in finding it. But uh, just her, just her name again, please. Louisine, L O U I S I N E. Have a mic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. She was a pretty remarkable person. And again, these wealthy women—they didn't have to do this. They were wealthy. They had time, and sometimes their spouses and their brothers and their sons didn't want them to do it. They controlled the purse strings. Uh, wealthy women didn't always have the freedoms that we think they did. Um, and they didn't have to do this, but they did. And they actually endangered themselves, some of them, to, to uh, work the suffrage. Okay, are there any other um, questions or um, anyone like to I have, a, I have a question. It's not sure. an historical question. I'm just curious. Uh, you identified that there are 45 women that are serving in elected office. What is that as a percentage? You know, um, is it 50-50 or 20-80? I'd, I'd be interested in knowing. Okay. Yes, I was actually, um, Kathy, I was afraid somebody would ask that question. I did <laughs> not compute when I sent, we did send, just so everybody knows, we sent a letter to, and a Votes for Women sash to all 45 of the women elected officials in Shelter Island, Southhold Town, East Hampton Town, and Southampton Town. And I did not compute um, all the <laughs> offices um, in all four towns and what the women, percentage, you know, was. Um, but it occurred to me that I should try to do that, but I didn't get around to it. So I'm sorry. But I thought somebody might ask that question. Uh, <laughs> so if, if I were in public office, actually, as you are, I probably would want to know that. I, I guess maybe I would have to go to all the websites, um, you know, for all the villages and all the towns and add everything up. Um, well, we but, know there's only 26 women senators and we know there's about 17% in the House of Representatives. Local government might have a, a greater percentage, but it's not enough, whatever it is. Can I just say in North Haven, it's one to five. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and Carver as well. Thank you very much. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for this wonderful event and for this honor. And I thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions, Steve? Uh, let's see if we have anything new. And we have, uh, let's see, Jerling Jer uh, says, yeah. Good to have Sorna Truth be represented, as well as the other great women in the suffragette efforts and in expanding liberties for women. Um, we, let's see. So we put the email addresses up there. So Arlene's email is on there, a uh, hinklemeyer at, at uh, optonline.net. Um, it's right there in the chat if anybody um, would like to to contact and it doesn't look like we have any more uh, questions on the chat.
but if anyone would like to um, add a question to the chat or un unmute your mic or raise hand, um, you're very welcome to do so. Okay, I had some more um, announcements I was going to make, which will bring on a, a couple other people onto this, <laughs> onto this Zoom. Um, in conclusion, we do want to thank um, the East Hampton Public Library, especially reference said Stephen Spataro, who has Thanks. been handling this, <laughs> um, and director Dennis Fabisak for hosting this program. The West Hampton Free Library, especially program coordinator Nola Thacker, director Daniel Waskowitz, and librarian Sarah Zerowin. And you. of course, our speaker, Antonia Petraj, <laughs> for creating this wonderful PowerPoint program, how, explaining how it took over 70 years to win the vote. If you would like to celebrate further, do register on Southampton's Rogers Memorial Library website for two other programs we're co-sponsoring next week, and you'll receive the Zoom link from them. Monday, August 17th at 5.30, a rousing Ladies of Liberty musical review created by Valerie DiLorenzo. And on Wednesday, August 19th at 12 noon, a PowerPoint titled The 19th Amendment and the Fight for Universal Suffrage by our own league member, Martha Potter. At the end of that program, our co-president, Susan Wilson, will acknowledge the last group of women elected officials, and that is those in Southampton town government and our Suffolk County legislator and family court judge. And um, as Ann Marshall mentioned, we can look forward to the August 26th unveiling of the statue in Central Park of the three suffragists, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Sojourner Truth. And also on August 26th, there's going to be a national illumination of public buildings and bridges in purple and gold. Um, so I, I know that our East Hampton Historical Society director, Maria Van, is on this Zoom, so maybe she can tell us more. She sent out information about this to many community organizations and um, is planning to do something. Maria, are you there? I'm here, thanks for having me. I'm very excited, it was a, a great program. Thanks for, for doing this and hosting this. So um, next week, the Historical Society is going to launch a video on social media, which is gonna promote certain things that we're doing to mark this great 100th anniversary of women's um, enfranchisement and, and, and the right to vote. So on um, August 26th, we are taking part in this national initiative um, that Arlene mentioned called Forward Into Light, which you could Google and be involved with if you're interested. This initiative is put forward by the C Congressional Women's Suffrage Commission. And on August 26th, they're encouraging um, people uh, in cultural institutions, um, community buildings to illuminate their sites um, on that evening in gold and purple. Uh, we are going to be taking part in that. Um, the windows at Osborne Jackson House Porch, um, Clinton Academy uh, windows, as well as the Moran turret will be illuminated that evening to recognize um, women's suffrage in East Hampton and beyond. Um, also, I uh, wanted to mention that um, with the announcement next week, uh, we are going to host a small exhibit at Clinton Academy on September 19th. It is a poster exhibit from the Smithsonian. It's a, um, I guess, a smaller version of their large insta installation called Votes for Women, a Portrait of Persistence. And with this poster exhibit, we are going to be supplementing with objects from our own collection of uh, the East Ends uh, women's suffrage movement. So that will be on September 19th at Clinton Academy from 10 to 2. Um, we will have more information out and available next week about that. Um, there'll be time tickets and, you know, in this day and age, we have to do that because of, you know, what, the pandemic. 
Um, but we're also, um, I mentioned to Arlene today, we're inviting the League of Women Voters to be present because we really want you to be handing out voter registrations. So um, I hope we'll all see you there. And if you have any questions, you can find my email on our website and, and please, um, you know, contact me. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's um, exciting to look forward to. And I did pass on her request to our voter services chair, Barbara McClancy, who I hope is on this uh, Zoom as well. Um, okay, and I just wanted to announce that our, our league's last event in the 100th anniversary celebrations will be a repeat of what was done statewide in 2017. We will go to the grave site of East Hampton suffrage leader May Groot Manson and Southampton suffrage leader Elizabeth Halsey White and place I voted stickers by their grave on election day, November 3rd, to commemorate all they did for us. So that will be our last event on election day. Um, and if and of course, I want to say, do consider joining the League of Women Voters <laughs> in this special 100th um, anniversary year. A membership form is on our website and we would love to have you. So- um, Thank you, I just make one more uh, statement? Yes. There is going to be a statue honoring Rosalie Gardner-Jones. Uh, Governor Cuomo has um, commissioned the statue uh, honoring Rosalie Gardner-Jones and it will be placed uh, in the Colston Harbor Library in the state park there. So that should be coming up next year. So very that's good. We're very happy about that. Are there any further questions? Um, we, let's see, we don't have... Okay. It's exactly four o'clock. So our program lasted exactly one hour if there's nothing else um, that people want to say. Um, so we thank you all for attending. Uh, we had a very good attendance and we thank um, Antonia again and the libraries and of course the women elected officials who appeared on this Zoom. Um, thank you all. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see, here we have.